questions. Questions are had. Lana had the honorable leader of the opposition. After eight years, this prime minister is not worth the cost, Mr. Speaker. He said that doubling the national debt would have no effect because interest rates were low. But those same deficits have fueled interest rate increases. And next year, we will spend $52 billion a year. That's $3,000 per capita in debt service. That's more than we'll be spending on health. Why is the prime minister spending more for bankers than for nurses? The right honorable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, since last week, more and more Canadians are having trouble believing the leader of the opposition. Let me bring back the true facts. Canada's debt is the lowest in the G7. We have the best debt to GDP ratio in the G7 and inflation keeps going down while maintaining services that Canadians rely on. The conservative leader would cut child care services to seniors, benefits, uh, and care for children. We will continue to invest. We're there for Canadians. We will continue to make responsible investments. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, that's false. Seniors are having to cut now, and other Canadians too, uh, when it comes to groceries, for example. The director of Quebec Food Bank said that the situation is unprecedented and dramatic. 61 percent of food banks were running short of supplies. That's the poverty after eight years of this government who's boosted food prices with his inflationist spending and his carbon tax. Will he reverse those policies so Canadians can afford to eat? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's getting a bit hard to believe what the opposition leader is saying, because instead of accelerating the enactment and the passage of Bill C-56, which would help Canadians with more competition in the grocery sector, he held up its passage. He found ways to slow that bill down, and that bill could help Canadians. We will continue to help Canadians out. We will invest in the economy in supports for Canadians while staying on a responsible financial course. It's impossible to believe anything this Prime Minister says. First, when he gave $15 billion for one battery plant, he said there'd be no foreign workers. It was all a rumour. And then he said it would be one. And then his minister said there'd be a few. Now the company says it will be 900. This is $15 billion, $1,000 in cost for every single family. And now they're giving the money for 900 workers to do foreign workers to do a job that the Canadian Building Trades Union said could be done by our people at a cost of $300 million of lost wages for our union workers. Will the Prime Minister release the contract so we find out how many Canadian tax dollars are going to foreign replacement workers? The right honourable Prime Minister. Again, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to have to uh, correct the facts uh, in this House of Commons, yes, given uh, what the Leader of the Opposition continues to say. 2,300 local Canadian construction jobs and 2,500 permanent Canadian jobs when the Stellantis plant is completed. Right. There will be 3,000 jobs in the region when the North Bolt plant in Quebec is completed. Uh, you'd think the Leader of the Opposition would support those, but he doesn't. No, He's he uncontrolled urge to make everything a partisan issue means he's not supporting the investments that are going to help in Windsor, in St. Thomas, uh, in Quebec, or elsewhere across the country. Right. He wants cuts. We want investments in the future of Canadians. Yeah, yeah. Right. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. This Prime Minister has forced 7 million Canadians to cut back on their diet right. to a point where they are no longer healthy. Yeah. This Prime Minister has forced Canadians to cut their budget for food and therefore a record smashing two million people are lined up at a food bank every month around corners in ways that we haven't seen since the Great Depression. That's the austerity he's opposed on Canadians. Now he wants to quadruple the carbon tax on the farmers who bring us 
our food. We have a common sense conservative bill, C234. Will the Prime Minister stop blocking this bill in the Senate, let it pass so that our farmers can produce food and our people can afford to eat it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, if the Leader of the Opposition actually cared about Canadians being able to afford their food, uh, they wouldn't have dragged their heels uh, on the passage of C-56 uh, that is increasing wow. competition in the grocery sector. Uh, but indeed, Mr. Speaker, there are a lot of factors that, uh, that deliver higher food prices, uh, not just for Canadians, for people around the world. And one of the key ones is Russia's continued illegal invasion of Ukraine, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, a we can affirm clearly that we will stand with Ukraine with everything necessary for as long as necessary. As we saw last week, no Conservative politician can say the same in this House. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Actually, we are the only party that has stood with Ukraine, Mr. Speaker. Prime Minister, I understand what he's doing. He has imposed so much misery here at home, whether by doubling housing costs, forcing people into tent encampments, uh, forcing two million people to go to a food bank. These are the problems here at home at the kitchen table. He is so desperate to talk about anything else that he avoids talking about what's happening in our own country. So will he answer the question? Will he take his tax off our farmers so our people can afford to eat? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition full well knows that 97% of fuel emissions uh, in the agricultural sector, in the farming sector, are already exempt from our price on pollution. But he is so desperate to try and score partisan points that he actually refused to stand in support of something v Volodymyr Zelensky asked us for in this House. How is the Leader of the Opposition explaining to Ukrainian Canadians right across the country that he no longer stands with Ukraine on things that they need right now? Order, please. The Honourable Member for Belle Oeil Chambly. Mr. Speaker, in recent days, we've heard gunshots in Montreal. Glass has been shattered. There's been graffiti. And it's all been directed at the Jewish community. We fear that these acts were in some way encouraged by an exception that allows hate speech and incitations to violence under the criminal code. In light of recent events, was, will the Prime Minister agree to do away with the religious exception under the criminal code? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, I fully agree with my Honourable Colleague that the increase in Islamophobia and anti-Semitism is rising in Canada. There's been more hatred. It's unacceptable. I condemn the attack against the CCJ. We condemn all violence. We will look at the bill put forward by my honorable colleague to see whether indeed that could help fight hate and incitements to violence. It's a complex issue, but we will work constructively to protect Canadians. No, no, have... The Honourable Member for belle chambly I cautiously, am cautiously optimistic about that. I hope we'll get somewhere on this, but the bill is very brief. It's just about repealing two sections in the Criminal Code that create exceptions. They're used to justify and allow and perpetuate hate speech. Will the Prime Minister agree to move forward swiftly in passing this necessary and straightforward bill? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I said, all forms of hatred have no place in Canada and should be condemned. 
the main thing is to unite Canadians and Quebecers. And hate speech is not allowed under the criminal code. Calls for genocide, public incitement to hatred are already forbidden. We will take a close look at the proposed legislation put forward by the bloc leader, and we will be there to work together to protect Canadians while respecting the free society we live in. Honorable the Honourable Member for Rosemont, La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, thanks to the hard work of the Quebec and Canadian labour movements and the insistence of the NDP, we will have anti-scab legislation in this country. The law will make it possible to negotiate better working conditions and wages for workers. But we had to force the Liberals to do it. And the, Liber the Conservatives, rather, who claim to be on the workers' side, refused to say whether they will vote for this bill, which would help increase families' purchasing power. Mr. Speaker, the anti-scab law must be passed and enter into force quickly. Will the Liberals do it, or will they drag their feet some more? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I understand that the NDP likes to say that they're the party of the workers, but since 2015, we've been there to demonstrate that we are with a, a repealing anti-union legislation that came into force under the Harper government. We've been there to show that we're willing to work hand in hand with unions We've done that since 2015, and we will keep doing so. We're very pleased with this legislation that prohibits replacement workers. We're glad that the NDP worked together with us, and we hope the Conservatives will understand that in order to build a stronger middle class, it requires strong unions. So we need to support unions, too. From Hamilton Centre. For decades, new Democrats and the Canadian Labour Congress have fought Liberals and Conservatives for anti-scab legislation. Yeah. And this session, the NDP used our power to force the Liberals to finally respect collective bargaining rights. And while the Conservative leader pretends to have the backs of workers, when push comes to shove, he's nowhere to be found to stand up for them. CLC leaders are here on the Hill today demanding that the anti-scab legislation be implemented sooner than the 18-month Liberal timeline. So will the Prime Minister commit to the necessary changes to truly support workers and implement the anti-scab C-58 as quickly as possible. The right honourable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, we know uh, to uh, which extent strong unions and collective bargaining are essential to the prosperity of the middle class in this country. That's why, from 2015 onwards, this government has been a friend to organized labour, has worked with them to overturn uh, the anti-union legislation uh, that the Stephen Harper government brought in, including uh, with the uh, leader of the opposition as a minister in that government. We've continued to stand with workers. We're very very pleased that the NDP is supporting our, our work, uh, replacement workers bill. Uh, we really hope uh, that the Conservatives will actually understand that supporting workers means supporting unions. Uh, we hope the Conservatives will stand up and support our anti-scab legislation. Speaker, the Prime Minister continues to dodge the question about the tax he plans to quadruple on Canadian farmers. One farm alone in my riding is spending $150,000 a year on carbon taxes. And the Prime Minister wants to quadruple that number up to 600000 That might put the farm out of business, which would mean we'd have to buy more foreign, expensive food from more polluting countries. And the Prime Minister is blocking a common-sense Conservative bill, C-234, in the Senate that would take the tax off our farmers. Will he commit, commit here and now to another carbon tax flip-flop to carve it out for our farmers so our people can afford to eat. The Honourable Government House Leader. There's only one party in this House that's flip-flopping, and it's the Conservatives with regards to their support for Ukraine. That's Mr. Right. Speaker, the Ukrainian-Canadian Congress has expressed its disappointment with the Conservatives for voting against the Canada-Ukraine free trade agreement. That's in right. fact, they're calling on the Conservatives to change their position, to vote for the bill, and to support Ukraine. Yes. Mr. Speaker, exactly it's hard to do. trust what the Leader of the Opposition says because he keeps changing his position. He says he supports Ukraine, but he didn't in his actions. He could demonstrate, direct his caucus to support this legislation and to support Ukraine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, we're against the carbon tax deal that, their vote, that they put before the House, right. and we're against quadrupling the carbon tax on Canadian farmers. Right. The Prime Minister can't, can neither defend his position, nor is, does he have the courage to just admit, as he did on home heating oil, that he was wrong. He plans to quadruple the tax on our farmers who feed our people, which will send millions more people to the food bank. So will he rise today and show the courage to admit he was wrong and back Conservative Bill C-234 to take the tax off our farmers so that our people can afford to eat? Get up and answer. The Honourable Government House Leader. It's ironic to hear from the leader of the official opposition about courage to admit he was wrong. In fact, on Thursday, when he was called out by the media for alleging uh, falsely that there was a terrorist attack, instead of taking ownership like any Canadian would be expected to do, he blamed the media and he doubled down. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition has a real challenge with taking responsibility for his actions and his decisions, and quite frankly, Frankly, Canadians deserve better, and they deserve to know the truth behind his decisions and his actions. Thank you. Here, here, here. The Honourable Member from Foothills. Farmers from across Canada are calling on Liberal appointed senators to support a common sense Conservative Bill 234, which would lower costs on farming and making food more affordable. But the Liberals' Prime Environment Minister has threatened to resign if there's any carbon tax car votes. That's amazing when you have a record shattering 2 million Canadians relying on food banks. The Environment Minister's dedication to making life unaffordable is unwavering. But will his Prime Minister? Ask that his environment minister stop threatening so called independent senators and allow the passage of 234 so Canadians can afford to feed themselves. The Honourable Minister for Climate Change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With your permission, I would like to read you an extract from a, a news article. Canadian senator flees home amid safety concerns following wanted poster incident. In a disturbing turn of events, Canadian Senator Bernadette Clement was reportedly forced to leave her home due to fears for her safety. The incident came after a provocative post akin to a wanted poster was shared online by the Conservative Party of Canada, Mr. Speaker. So who's bullying who in this House and in the Senate? Certainly not us. We're not telling senators how to vote. The Conservative Party is. Honourable Member from Foothills. Here's the facts that the Environment Minister refuses to recognize. An Alberta poultry farm paid $180,000 a year in carbon taxes just to heat and cool their barn. When the Prime Minister quadruples his carbon tax, they'll be paying $480,000 a year. That farmer said he can't afford those tax hikes. His options are to pass on those costs to consumers or just call it quits. Is that what this environment minister wants, is to bankrupt Canadian farmers and force Canadians to food banks just to save his job? Yes. The Honourable Minister for the Environment and Climate Change. Here's what independent senators said about what the Conservative Party is doing in the House and in the Senate, Mr. Speaker. Senator Saint-Germain said, plucked violently through his earpiece and stood before Senator Clement as we sat at our desk, yelling and berating us for proposing this routine motion. She said the Conservative senator pointed fingers at another ISG members and suggested he would block work doing on the Senate's Human Resources Committee. And no matter how much the Conservative Party would like us to believe that this is about taxation, it is not. It's about bullying, Mr. Speaker. That's what it is. Once again, I'd like to call on all members to please refrain from speaking when it's not your turn. That way, all members can hear the question and the answer. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Liberal government is costing Canadians more and more. The Liberal carbon tax on farmers is driving up the price of food. And I would remind you that people are already struggling when it comes to grocery costs. The Conservatives are proposing a common sense measure, which is to scrap the Liberal carbon tax on food production. That's Bill C-234, which is in the Senate. 
everybody is with us on this. It's just the sore losers that don't agree with us on this. Why don't they tell their unelected senators not to be holding up this bill? The Honorable Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Mr. Speaker, it's interesting to see the Conservatives double standard on this Senate because they've used it to block legislation they don't like. They don't hesitate to do that. I'd also like to point out that in a recent, a recent article, independent senators were bullied by a Conservative senator at the request of the Conservative Party of Canada. That's not the way things work in this place. You don't t we don't tell the Senate senators what to do. That's not how it works, uh, unlike the Conservative Party of Canada. The Honourable Member for Louis saint -Laurent. Mr. Speaker, the fact in my writing is, and I'm sure it's the same in Montreal, the fact is that food banks are overrun, not with food, but with people coming to use the food bank. People who used to contribute to food banks are now relying on them. Over 2 million Canadians are using food banks. And our proposal is to help farmers, to help bring the price of food down. But the Liberal government wants senators to defy the will of the elected House. Is that what you call democracy? None I have been the Honourable Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. I find this a bit strange, Mr. Speaker, that the Conservative Party never mentions the $1.7 billion in support for farmers that we give them all across the country. It's also interesting that they never talk about the impact of climate change, which causes, costs farmers hundreds of millions of dollars, and that number is constantly rising. And speaking of the Senate, Mr. Speaker, media reports show that a Conservative senator, at the request of the Conservative Party, has been bullying other senators. Uh, and this was orchestrated, this campaign of violence was orchestrated by the party, Mr. Speaker. Before I proceed to the member for Belle et Chambly, I'd just like to remind all members that even in our comments, even if you don't have the floor, it's still important to use parliamentary language. And people should not be accused of lying deliberately, even by hecklers. The Honourable Member for Belle et Chambly. Mr. Speaker, in recent days, we've seen the Minister of Immigration say some disrespectful things, disrespectful towards a bloc member who was simply asking a question and merely doing his job. But uh, let's just uh, move on. The minister should recognize that uh, given his own government's commitments, the federal government owes Quebec $460 million for accommodating asylum seekers and refugees. Can the minister admit that? The Honourable Minister, what I said quite clearly, Mr. Speaker, was that Canada is not, the federal government is not a banking machine. We're not an ATM. We will meet with our Quebec counterparts to discuss their, the, their out of pocket. Uh, but it's not something I'm going to discuss on the floor of the House of Commons with the Bloc Québécois. I'm going to discuss it with my provincial counterpart in private, the Honourable Member for Belle et Chambly. I don't know who he takes himself for, Mr. Speaker, but he owes Quebec $460 million. If I don't pay my credit card, I don't say I'm not a banking machine. It's a bit facile. Uh, as, an, uh, as an answer. It's a lack of respect for parliamentarians. It's a lack of respect he's showing for Quebec. Why doesn't he make a deal with Quebec and pay off his debt to Quebec, especially when Quebec is taking in more than its fair share, share of refugees? What's with this minister? I would like to remind everyone that questions have to go via the chair. The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, quite simply, the bloc is not Quebec. And this false indignation is what it is. It's phony. Once they have a concrete claim, we can discuss it. But clearly, I have a duty to speak to my responsible 
counterparts in the Quebec government. It's a two-way communication. It's not a one-way communication. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. I suggest Quebecers take note that, according to the Minister of Immigration and his friends, a Liberal Member of Parliament is worth more than a Bloc member. I invite Quebecers to take note that the federal government is using an agreement with Quebec. Quebec spends $460 million under its part of the deal, and then the, and basically they're doing the federal government's work for them under this deal, but it's, it might be a two-way communication, but it also requires intelligence. The Honourable Minister of Immigration, Mr. Speaker, as you can see, I'm not the one throwing insults around, and the height of irony in all of this is that the Bloc claims that this is purely federal jurisdiction. That's false. I think they've been here in Ottawa too long to realize what the jurisdictional situation is. They simply have to look at the Constitution to see that it's a shared jurisdiction. Both levels of government here are responsible governments, and I will be taking this up with the responsible government in question. Speaker, it doesn't matter what the government thinks about Bill C-234. It doesn't matter what the Senate thinks about the bill because taxation and spending are the exclusive right of this House, right. not the Senate. In our system, there is no taxation without representation. Right. Section 53 of the Constitution says all financial legislation must originate in this House. Standing Order 80 says that this House alone grants aids and supplies. Right. When will the Prime Minister direct his representative in the Senate to respect this democratic institution, the only democratic institution in this country, and pass the tax bill? The Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I mean, the, the irony coming from the other side of the House is almost too thick to handle today when we hear uh, members' office talking about respecting democracy or exactly. democratic institutions. There's a pattern of behaviour here that I thought was, you know, maybe just with the Leader of the Opposition. I didn't expect it from the member from Wellington, Halton Hills. But as he would know, there are no Liberal senators on this side, only Conservative senators. The Senate is independent. Unfortunately, they're bullying senators to force them to step back, and that's totally unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, we're used to live in a country where the governor regularly ignored bills passed by the elected Legislative Assembly. We used to live in a country where the appointed upper chamber used to regularly ignore bills passed by the elected lower chamber. That was a country long, long ago whose institutions were abolished after the rebellions of 1837. But now the unelected Senate thinks it's some sort of chateau, clique or Tory compact, ignoring a tax bill passed by this elected House. Again, when will the Prime Minister direct his representative in the Senate to respect the right and will of this House and pass the tax bill. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, Speaker, speaking of respecting the will of this House, Perhaps the leader of the Conservative Party would like to talk to the Conservative senators that sit in his caucus and ask them to pass the bail reform bill that was passed by this House of Commons. The leader of the opposition thought it was so important that he was going to recall Parliament last summer to pass it, and Conservative premiers regularly talk to me about the importance of passing that legislation. So perhaps he talked to the Conservative senators about that important bill to keep Canadians safe. The Honourable Member for Mégantic-Lérable. Mr. Speaker, with the holidays approaching, after eight years, we can see that this Prime Minister is in panic mode. He's desperate. Bill C-234 would exempt farmers. It's blocked, the GST for farmers, and it's blocked in the Senate. And he's asking unelected senators to kill this bill even though it was passed by elected officials here in the House of Commons. Why is he using unelected senators 
to run counter to the Constitution and undermine farmers and Canadian families. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, let's keep talking about respect for democracy in the House of Commons. The Conservative senators, who are also unelected, are hindering passage of an important bill for, on gun control, and it was passed here in the House. So if our friends opposite, Mr. Speaker, want to do something for democracy, they should ask Conservative senators who sit in their caucus to pass Bill C-21, which was passed by the House of Commons, to protect Canadians against illegal guns in Canada. The Honourable Member for Megantic lerable Mr. Speaker, the Constitution is very clear. Section 53 of the 1867 Constitution Act states that all money bills must come from the House of Commons. And the House regulations are also very clear. These money bills cannot be amended by the Senate. These maneuvers to bully senators goes against the Constitution, it goes against House rules, and it goes against democracy. Will the Liberals stop with this unconstitutional filibustering of Bill C-234 and end these carbon taxes on farmers so that people can actually feed their families at Christmas? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, the Conservatives like to pretend in this House, like to claim that they're trying to protect Canadians, for example, from firearms violence, or ensuring that bail is effective in helping keep communities safe. Conservative Premiers, such as Premier Ford, have asked for this. So if they want to send some message, to send a message to their conservative senator friends tomorrow at their caucus meeting, that would be a great idea. The Honourable Member from Vancouver East. People with full-time jobs are sleeping in their cars, and yet the Liberals are delaying funding for public housing until 2025. Experts are saying investing in community housing is not only socially responsible, but economically sound. The Lloyd just released a report to say increasing the community housing stock could boost the GDP by up to $136 billion, while the corporate-controlled Conservative leader is off demonizing in community housing, the Bank of Canada says it's anti-inflationary. Right. So, will the Liberals stop <laughs> delaying housing investments in the fall economic statement to get housing, affordable housing, built now? The Honourable Minister for Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for her question and for her joining me this morning to discuss uh, the need to build more affordable housing with community housing providers who are in Ottawa today. With respect, the crisis that we're dealing nationally is a result of 30 years of failure to invest in affordable housing. We changed that with the adoption of the National Housing Strategy in 2017 and continue to make the measures. The fall uh, advanced measures today. The fall economic statement included a recapitalization of our affordable housing programs to the tune of a billion dollars and an additional additional $300 million that will flow early in the new year, just weeks from now. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Nanaimo, Ladysmith. Mr. Speaker, a 12-year-old boy in British Columbia has died by suicide, linked to cyberbullying and sextortion. This is a tragedy, with the most common targets of this criminal behaviour being children. Despite this, Conservatives don't even want to see big tech regulated responsibly. The Liberals promised an online harms bill within 100 days of the last election. Over two years later, we are still waiting. So will the government finally make the internet safer for our kids, or is this another Liberal broken promise? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for this question. Uh, when I say my heart goes out to this family, I say that on behalf of every member in this chamber. No family should have to experience what this family is currently going through, Mr. Speaker. We recently passed Bill S-12 in this House, uh, which addresses some of these concerns about online safety. The protection of children in our society is of utmost importance, and I have a commitment from this side of the House and from all sides of the House that we will do everything we can to make sure that they are protected. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Winnipeg South Centre. 
Mr. Speaker, every day people across the country lose loved ones to overdoses caused by the increasingly toxic illegal drug supply. Tackling this national public health crisis requires us to leverage all of the tools at our disposal. I am the son of an addictions doctor working on the front lines of this crisis in Winnipeg every day. And like many of us in this chamber, I have members of my own family suffering from the harms of substance abuse. For me, as for so many Canadians, this is deeply personal. Can the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions please update this chamber on the renewed Canadian Drugs and Substances Strategy? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for his question. We all know that the member is a compassionate and tremendous advocate on these issues and championing to help support our most vulnerable who struggle with substances. Recently, we announced the renewed Canadian Drugs and Substances Strategy, a comprehensive framework guiding our efforts to address the toxic drug, and overdose, drug supply and overdose crisis. It's centred on promoting public health and protecting public safety. In his own riding, we supported Sunshine House recently that's doing tremendous work, and together, Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to work to address and end the toxic drug and overdose crisis. Well the Honourable Member from Chatham-Kent, Leamington. After eight years, this NDP Liberal government is just not worth the cost. Greenfield Global operates in Chatham, buying corn and converting it to a variety of alcohols, from pharmaceuticals to biofuels. They buy corn from Canadian farmers and from nearby American farmers who do not pay the carbon tax on fertilizer, the delivery of seed, and the delivery and drying of their corn. Can the Prime Minister explain what happens to Canadian farmers' bottom line when they pay the carbon tax and have to compete with American farmers that don't in their own backyard? Why is he interfering with the so-called independent senators blocking C-234? Here, here. The Honourable Minister for Agriculture and Agri-Food. Mr. Speaker, my honourable colleague is well aware farmers and ranchers are on the front lines of climate change. They expect parties to have a plan to, to deal with climate change. We have a plan. My honourable colleague's party does not. For an example, two weeks ago, I was in Winnipeg and announced a $9.2 million for living labs. In fact, living labs, Mr. Speaker, is to make sure that farmers, ranchers, uh, uh, scientists, and the industry itself work together to make sure that farmers and ranchers stay on the cutting line. We have and will continue to support our farmers. The Honourable Member from Dolphin Swan River, Nipawa. Mr. Speaker, we know why the Prime Minister is blocking the carbon tax carve out for Canadian farmers. It's because his Environment Minister has threatened to quit if Bill C 234 passes. But the Environment Minister doesn't care about Canadian farmers because he's jetting off to Dubai for two weeks. It's, it's the middle of day in Ottawa, but it's the middle of night in Dubai. So will the Prime Minister at least allow Senators to pass a carbon tax carve-out while his Minister is asleep in Dubai? The Honourable Minister for the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, yes, I will be proudly representing Canada in, at COP28 in Dubai, and I will be in good company, Mr. Mr. Speaker. The Premier of Alberta will be there. Premier Smith is leaving tomorrow for, for COP28 for COP with the largest provincial delegation we have ever seen in the history of COPs, Mr. Speaker. We will have the Premier of Saskatchewan, who will be there as well, Scott Moe, with the largest Saskatchewan delegation we've ever seen. Quebec will be there with more than 120 representatives from civil society, business and trade union, Mr. Speaker, and I'll be proud to represent Canada at COP28. The Honourable Member from Lakeland. Yeah, I'm sure we'll all look forward to see what those high carbon hypocrites come up with. But, Mr. Speaker, after eight years, it's clear this Prime Minister isn't worth the cost. The Hunger Report said food bank usage has gone up for seven years in a row. The NDP Liberals' carbon taxes hike food prices and force Canadians to skip meals or cut the basics. Common sense Conservatives will axe the tax for all for good, but a quick fix is Conservative Bill C-234 that will cut it from farm fuels. So, will the Prime Minister stop interfering with his senators and let them pass it so farmers can afford to feed Canadians and so Canadians can afford to eat. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. 
Mr. Speaker, the MP for Lakeland has the privilege of representing the amazing town of Vigraville. That town is a source of pride for all Ukrainian Canadians, especially from the prairies, for the amazing Kisinka that the people there put up, pride in their heritage. Is she ashamed that her party has voted against Ukraine? I hope she is, because she should be. I know that the Honourable Member from uh, Battle Creek, uh, Crowfoot, is a very passionate man, but his voice does carry, and it is very unique. So I will ask all members to please keep their voices down, because we know that when one person has the floor. The Honourable Member from Lakeland. Well, Ukraine needs weapons in Canada's energy, not the Liberals' carbon tax. And I'm confident that the Ukrainian farmers, who are my neighbours and friends and relatives, are, support that position. I'll never stop fighting for them. Yeah. But that right there is the Liberals' distract and divide agenda. And it's only these guys who don't get that when you tax the farmers who grow the food, the truckers who ship the food, the store that sells the food, and the consumer that buys the food, Canadians can't afford the food. Yet this PM is going to quadruple his carbon tax, even though he already forces the people to choose between heating and eating. Now, he can help bring down those costs right now. So when will the PM get out of his former Liberal donor candidate MP senators and get them to pass the Common Sense Conservative Bill? The Honourable Minister of Finance and Deputy Prime Minister. extremely confident that Ukrainian Canadians across our amazing country are in favour of our free trade deal with Ukraine. And I'm confident because the Ukrainian Canadian Congress said so. And I'm confident because President Zelensky wants that deal. And you know what? It's a great way to bring down the prices of food and fuel for the whole world by stopping Vladimir Putin. I just don't understand why these Conservatives are standing against Ukraine. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Santia saint pagot Mr. Speaker, today unions representing tens of thousands of aerospace workers in Quebec are here on the Hill, and we're very happy to see them here. They're here to say that Ottawa should not be giving more than $8 billion of our money without a bid for tender to Boeing to replace the Aurora aircraft. It's a farce, and that's not my opinion. It's what Michael Hood, the former commander of the Air Force, said. Mr. Speaker, workers are demanding that Quebec expertise can compete in this process. Will Ottawa finally announce a competitive bid for tender? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank our colleague for underscoring our expertise, the expertise of our aerospace workers in Quebec and elsewhere in Canada. That is why this decision, which will be made shortly, which is an important one to secure our defence and our military sector, and also to support the aerospace industry in Canada. We know this represents 220,000 jobs and it contributes $20 billion to our GDP. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, it's almost the holidays, but the federal has no right to gift $8 billion to Boeing without a call for tender. Everyone's asking for this process. Aerospace workers, the Quebec industry, the premiers of Quebec and Ontario, members of all parties in this House at the Defence Committee have been asking for this. Everyone understands that we need a bid for tender so that the best offer may win in replacing these aircraft. Everyone seems to understand, except for the Liberal government, when will they finally launch this process? The Honourable Minister of Public Services and Procurement, I'd like to thank our colleague for giving me a chance to once again repeat how much talent we have here in the aerospace sector. There are many of these workers, and we will be there every day to support the needs of the Canadian Armed Forces. We know that we will be able to count on them over the next few years. The Honourable Member from York Simcoe. Mr. Speaker, these Liberals like to go on and on about Canada's AAA credit rating while jacking up taxes and driving more. Circumstances 
Jones. Allowed. The Honorable Member from York Simcoe, I had difficulty hearing his question. Can please start his question from the top. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 71% of food bank users say their circumstances have become much worse after eight years of this NDP Liberal government. If this Prime Minister spoke to real Canadians lined up at food banks, he'd know you can't feed a family with AAA credit rating. So will this Prime Minister stop blocking common sense conservative bill two, three, four, so Canadian families can feed themselves? Hey, hey, hey. The Honourable Minister for Families and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to invest in social security programs like the Old Age Security, Canada Pension Plan, and in families through the Canada Child Benefit and the $10 a day child care program, programs which the Conservatives continue to vote against, Mr. Speaker, totally lacking empathy or understanding of the struggle of Canadians. On this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, we will continue to govern with the needs of Canadians at the heart of everything we do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Edmonton Mill Woods. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Prime Minister's soft on crime policies, crime, chaos and disorder have become the norm in Canada. Just this last week, we have seen armed robberies, shootings of businesses, armed carjackings, extortion letters sent to business owners and international uh, gangsters directing shootings at families here in Canada. Mr. Speaker, when will this Prime Minister finally take the safety of Canadians seriously? Here, here. The Honourable Minister. Speaker, our government obviously has always taken the safety of Canadians seriously. Absolutely. And the Conservatives seem to be laughing and find that funny, Mr. Speaker. But good news, tomorrow morning they have a caucus meeting where Conservative senators will be present. And they should perhaps talk to their Conservative Senate parliamentary colleagues to ask them to please pass the legislation that this House adopted to strengthen bail conditions for serious violent offenders, something that our government worked on with premiers across the country, in conservative, including conservative premiers. And also, Mr. Speaker, there's important gun control legislation That's stuck in the Senate lucky. because conservatives They're won't lucky. pass it. The Honourable Member from Edmonton, Mill Woods. Mr. Speaker, that's another bill blocked by more Liberal Senators, and it was actually this Liberal uh, government's soft on crime policies like C5 and C75 that let serious violent criminals back onto our streets, and incidents of violent crimes have skyrocketed in, in, in since then. Violent crime is up by 39%. Murders are up 43%. Gang-related homicides and violent gun crimes are up over 100%, Mr. Right. Speaker. Right. Only Conservatives will end Liberal NDP soft on crime policies that keep violent offenders on the streets. Mr. Speaker, when will they get out of the way and allow common sense conservatives to bring home safer streets? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, my honourable friend's having some uh, difficulty attaching himself to the facts. It's the Conservative <laughs> senators, Mr. Speaker, who are blocking legislation Absolutely. requested by Conservative premiers and worked on by this government last spring and adopted by this House of Commons at all stages when we came back in September. So, Mr. Speaker, why isn't that legislation to strengthen bail reform and to keep Canadians safer? Why isn't that legislation adopted now? Because senators from the Conservative Party are blocking it, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, that might be something they'd like to do before Christmas. The Honourable Member from Halifax West. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, our government is continuing to support Canadians. As inflation continues and some prices remain too high. Yesterday, the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change spoke about new measures in the fall economic update to enable more Canadians to be able to pay for their housing while also helping them to reduce their home energy bills. Can the minister tell the House about these important measures? 
The Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for the question. Our government is addressing problems of affordability and environmental problems at the same time. We are increasing the number of affordable housing units in Canada and making it easier to save thousands of dollars every year on energy bills. We are helping Canadians obtain heat pumps thanks to an investment of $500 million over four years. On this side of the House, we are getting results for Canadians, both on affordability and the environment. Then I have the Honourable Member from Bay of Quinte. $15 billion, that's $1,000 per household and no guarantee for Canadian jobs. Not only are 900 jobs going to taxpayer-funded foreign workers, the union today said it would cost Canadian contractors $300 million in lost wages. This isn't deal, no deal. This is a terrible deal for workers who were promised jobs in Windsor. When will the minister responsible for costing the union $300 million, Canadian families $1,000 per household, release the contract that Canadians have paid for? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to protecting local jobs, we won't take any lessons from these Conservatives. When they were in power, we saw the rapid decline of our automotive industry and the loss of over 300,000 manufacturing jobs. Let's just review some of the most recent actions of Conservatives compromising local jobs. They are filibustering the Sustainable Jobs Act at Natural Resources Committee, a bill that gives workers a seat at the table in the clean economy. They are opposing landmark legislation that our government tabled on the ban of replacement workers, and they've opposed the Atlantic Accord, which is uh, supporting an offshore wind industry in Atlantic Canada. Those are just a few examples of the hypocrisy. The Honourable Member from Bay of Quinte. Mr. Speaker, the only thing Liberals are protected are taxpayer-funded foreign jobs. Here's what could have happened. We could have ensured, and Liberals could have ensured, we mine the material for batteries in Canadian mines with Canadian workers. We're not. We could have ensured that the parts for the cars were made by Canadian workers and Canadian factories. That's we're right. not. These could have been 100 percent Canadian jobs. They're not. Instead, Canadians are paying $1,000 a household, so Canadian contractors can lose $300 million and get ripped off. Why won't they release the contract? Is it because it should have been ripped up? Yeah! yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's just review what Lana Payne has said, the national president of Unifor, Canada's largest private sector union. And I quote, in an ironic twist, we've learned the program exists only because the Canada-Korea Free Trade Agreement negotiated and signed by, guess who, the Conservatives themselves back in 2014. They've all, she also said, either way, they are officially talking out of both sides of their mouth, and it's embarrassing. That's the largest private sector union in the country. While the Conservatives put their ignorance and recklessness on full display to Canadians, we'll stay focused on building a powerhouse auto industry. The Honourable Member for Pont Neuf, Jacques Cartier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This amateurish government is giving $7 billion of taxpayer money to fund foreign workers in the Montérégie region. Once again, this Prime Minister has failed to protect our Quebec workers. He didn't make sure that the agreement had minimum standards in order to force foreign businesses to hire Quebecers. This government is just not worth the cost. What is the Liberal government hiding in the contrast? And if there's nothing to hide, why not just make them public? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, these Conservatives who are against the new ec economy that would use the talents of all Quebecers and Canadians for the new economy, all of these positions for Quebecers and Canadians will be in the Montérégie region. The Conservatives wish that we hadn't signed this agreement because they don't know what they want to do for the economy. We will be here for Quebecers and Canadians. We will be there in Montérégie. We will be there throughout Canada. The Honourable Member from Northwest Territories. Mr. Speaker, Indigenous tourism was amongst the hardest hit sectors of the travel industry during the pandemic. But it was becoming one of the fastest growing segments of the tourism industry before the pandemic. And that opportunity still exists. 
The growth of indigenous tourism is an important element of reconciliation and a major opportunity for First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities. It was amongst the key priorities of the new federal tourism growth strategy announced this summer. Can the Minister of Tourism tell us what our government is doing to support indigenous tourism? Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleague for his important question. Our government wants to position the indigenous tourism industry for long-term sustainable growth. I recently announced the Indigenous Tourism Fund that will support thousands of projects within macro and small businesses across the country and in his riding of Northern Territories. Indigenous Tourism and Industry Association of Canada, ITAC, will provide financial assistance to build capacity among Indigenous businesses. Indigenous tourism has the power to transform the tourism sector. And more than that, it has the power to advance self-determination in economy of reconciliation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Windsor West. Mr. Speaker, once again, the ultra-rich owner of the Ambassador Bridge is trying to end the ban of hazardous materials on the bridge between Detroit and Windsor. Last year's bridge blockade proved we cannot put the country's most important trade link at risk so a billionaire can profit while endangering businesses, residents and the environment, including Great Lakes drinking water. These goods are already sa safely crossing the Blue Water Bridge now and in 18 months at the new Gordie Howe Bridge. Will this government not cave to the billionaire's greed to keep people safe and to keep the ban on. The Honourable Minister for Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's essential that we continue to make the investments and work with partners to keep our trade corridors open, including making the necessary investments to improve our country's national infrastructure that helps drive our local economy. With respect to the Honourable Member's very specific local concerns about the bridge he's raising his question, I'd be happy to speak with him after question period and set up a time to discuss the details in person as our schedules allow. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Edmonton, Griesba. Mr. Speaker, people living with disability are children, parents, grandparents, community members, our neighbours, our fellow Canadians, and they deserve to live in dignity. The few in Alberta who get some provincial support know it's not enough and feel they are being trapped in continual poverty. New Democrats and disability advocates fought to secure a national Canada disability benefit, but the Liberals are delaying. Edmontonians living with a disability don't have time to wait. When will the government implement a fully funded Canada disability benefit? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I am so happy that our House together passed an important disability benefit C-22. We are committed to making sure that this benefit is realized, that this will get dollars into the, the pockets of those who need it. For Canadians who are with disability, who are of working age, this will help alleviate poverty and help Canadians uh, who are looking towards this benefit. We will do so properly and without delay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And so brings this to an end of another question period. Point, two points of order I recognize here on the floor, the Honourable Member from Edmonton Sherwood Park. Thank you, um, thank you Mr. Chair, Sherwood Park, Park Horses, Saskatchewan. I have in my hand an article uh, from CTV with the following title, uh, Manifestation of Weakness, Zelensky Condemns Canada for Return of Russia, Germany. So I, I, I'm going to ask the Honourable Member, is he seeking unanimous consent of the House? Unanimous consent. I'm afraid I've, I've already heard that there is, a, there is a, not an appetite for unanimous consent. The Honourable Member from uh, St. Albert, Edmonton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Right.